settled in. Okay, good? All right. Hello, my name is Tim Converse, or Santiago the Magician. You may have seen some of my information on Chris Bradley's websites. We're going to be talking today with Chris about some of his articles and uh, a couple of books that he is working on for publication. Chris, how are you? I'm doing fine, thank you very much. Excellent. Let's start off by just a real simple question. Sure. Tell us about yourself. Well, I'm a person who, from a young age, decided he wanted to be a writer, and I spent pretty much all my life developing that skill set. Uh, to the extent to which I have an education, it's been in philosophy and history of science, which is, I thought, would be a little more useful for the kind of writing that I want to do than an English degree, mm -hmm. because it would allow me to speak more deeply, I think, about the subject matter. But I've been writing since I was about 10 years old, um, primarily because I wanted to write the sort of things I wanted to read. Is that what made you want to be an author? Yeah, I was kind of dissatisfied. I was like 10 years old. I remember the first thing I ever wrote, uh, fiction. It was uh, a monster movie pastiche. I'd seen a Godzilla movie, uh, the one on the one with Mothra and the two little uh -huh. fairies, right? And it was horrible. <laughs> it was absolutely horrible. And I said, like, wow, I really like the idea of a giant monster, so I'll write a story that involves a giant monster. It was attacking Australia, <laughs> and it was defeated <laughs> okay. by nuclear weaponry. Uh -huh. But that was kind of the, the motivation, originally to be a writer, okay. was to fix the problems that I'd seen in this other form of media, who actually movies. Right. Okay. Well, what are your influences as an, as an author? A lot. Numerous. Depends, actually, on what I'm writing. Right now, I'd say my heaviest influences are uh, Rogers Lasney and the Nine Princes of Amber books. They're mm -hmm. kind of apocal for me in terms of kind of like realistic fantasy characters in this environment where there was no real good guys or bad guys, just people doing things to each other, usually rotten people doing rotten things. Right. And James Elroy, who wrote the novel L.A. Confidential and Black mm -hmm. Dahlia, yes. uh, the very aggressive, stylized fiction with sex and violence and a lot of intrigue, which I also appreciated. Uh, also Alexander Dumas. Mm -hmm because very bold, vivid characters, and once again, not a distinction between like good guys and bad guys. I mean, D'Artagnan's not a better human being than Rishi Lid. Mm -hmm. He's just a, there's just an opposition to one another because of the political environment they are in. And uh, for stylistically, one of my, not so much for uh, when I'm writing with Simon Peter, or Cannot Arrive, but in fantasy material, H.P. Lovecraft mm -hmm. has served as a very important influence as well. I think those are probably the, the biggest influences that inform my current writing today. Would you consider your writing style to be along those lines, or is your writing style different? My is different. I mean, very much so. While I was influenced by them, I do not attempt to mimic them. I tried that for a while, and it didn't work. <laughs> okay. You know, I mean, I can write stuff that include like a lot of the same elements as like H.P. Lovecraft does, uh -huh. but I can't emulate the way that he does it because my own writing style is more towards for instance, dialogue, okay. character okay. action, and psychological development, which you don't see a lot of, for instance, in Lovecraft stuff. And sure. so I can't say that I try to emulate any of them, even though I've been influenced by all of them. Then. Now, Clearly, you think that you're a pretty good author. I mean, you've yeah. been doing this for a very long time. Sure. You've written and published a couple of articles and short stories mm -hmm. already. Right. You've written one full novel, and you're working on your second. Right. But you haven't been published yet, as far as those are concerned. Why do you think that is? A thousand to one odds. That's about the odds of any particular novel getting published inside the industry as it currently is. Okay. So it takes a lot of work. And there's a lot of writers that have written novels and not got them published, and it's not necessarily because the novels are bad or because they haven't worked hard, it's that they haven't uh, done what it takes to you know, generate the interest required for a publisher to publish the book, it's, which is really part of what this is about, Okay. that we're doing right here. Right. So the current book you're working on is Simon Peter, right. a book about the life of Jesus Christ told by the perspective of one of his apostles. Yes. Uh, my, what I've read so far suggests that this is going to be an incredibly controversial novel. Why are you writing it the way that you are? What is the reason for this approach? There are two real reasons why I'm writing it the, this way. First off is I want to address the Christian community. 
Okay. I mean, I'm an atheist, okay. and um, publicly so. And it seems to me that that the way that Christians think about this savior figure, Jesus, is done in no historical context, with no historical context. They see Jesus and you, you talk to them and they'll say, well, you know, Jesus isn't like other historical messiahs like Jim Jones or Muhammad, because you know, he's real and those other guys, you know, they're not real. And so I want to bring up in a discussion with, with the Christian community mm -hmm. that perhaps their messiah isn't too much different than these other messiahs when you take it from the point of view of someone from the outside. You know, from, from the point of view of an atheist or a Muslim or a Hindu, Jesus, well, not so much a, a Muslim, but you know, from a Hindu or a Buddhist, you know, mm -hmm. Jesus is just this person. And the way that they view them is in a particular historical context. They view Jesus in the context of a Jew living in first century Judea who developed this following in a, in a very normal manner. Okay. And I want to suggest to the Christian community that's what Jesus was, is this person who exists in this particular time and place. And I also want to suggest that most of these Messiah figures are kind of crazy. You look at the history of them, and it's a lot of darkness, a lot of abuse that happens to them, abuse they give to their followers, uh, madness, I mean, con men, and this isn't, I think, controversial. I mean, you look back at, at history, a number of Messiahs have, that have been historically who record it, mm -hmm. and so many of them are con men or madmen that I think it's legitimate to talk about the possibility that Jesus kind of fell in that category. And the second group of people that I want to discuss are kind of like secular demonists and atheists and other people who do not buy into the Christian proposition. Mm -hmm. For them, we still treat Jesus with a lot of respect as a group. Uh, recently, there was this like, scientific conference called Beyond Belief, and it was a whole bunch of atheists and non theistic scientists gathering together to talk about these religious matters and none of them could bring themselves to really criticize the person or character of Jesus Christ. Or you read books like Jesus and the Spiral of Violence mm -hmm. and what you see isn't a person saying, you know, he's this kind of madman, but he's a legitimate social reformer working within the context of the Jewish Palestinian situation in the first century. And why do we do that? Why isn't there a larger discussion about the possibility that Jesus was a fraud and a madman as well? And so I want to say to the, the kind of secular humanist and atheist community that we need to stop idolizing this figure. I mean, if we're going to, to condemn the religious proposition around Christianity, we can't really reserve a space for Jesus at the center of it and treat him with elaborate respect, as I think we frequently do. Do you feel, then, that Simon Peter, as a book, is going to have a wide appeal, or do you think it's really only going to be aimed at these two groups of people? Well, I mean, it, it will have a wide appeal because one of the two groups of people are Christians, which 60% of Americans are, are Christians, and you know, probably around 10% of atheists are, mm -hmm. uh, or 10% of Americans are atheists or right. secular humanists or somewhere in that area. So saying that I'm writing a book that appeals to 70% of the population, I think is saying it's going to be okay. pretty popular. <laughs> sure, that makes perfect sense. Is there any other thing that you want us to talk about right now, you want people to know about Simon Peter before we uh, wrap this up? Well, I think that uh, with Simon Peter, it is a, I would want people to really kind of question the assumptions upon which they base their understanding of that time and those characters. We, we think about them in a very particular fashion, and I'd like for people to kind of like look a little bit below that to see what else might be there. Not necessarily change their mind, but just to round out their education and their understanding of those people from that area. Excellent. Well, that's the uh, first interview we're doing with Chris. There are going to be more as uh, the book continues in its progress and more questions get to be asked. Go ahead and take a look at the credits at the end of this so that you can find Chris's website and my own. If you have any questions, you'll be able to contact us. Thank, Thank you. you.